uh, welcome to the um, uh, to the sixth episode of the second season of uh, the Young Researchers Forum on Detonation. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Carl Shatlan uh, as our invited speaker. Uh, Carl obtained his uh, master's degree in energy combustion and the environmental risk at the University of uh, Orleans in France. He obtained his PhD in 2016 from the Paris uh, uh, Saclay University from uh, the work he con uh, conducted on the experimental and the numerical investigation of the liquid phase stability of fuel surrogate at uh, AFP Energies Nouvelle and uh, Ansta Paris uh, Tech, uh, both located near Paris. After his PhD, he went to Ansta Paris Tech as a postdoctoral researcher on the numerical investigation of hybrid fuel combustion. In addition, his research backgrounds are in the experimental and the numerical kinetic studies of different reactive systems, such as the uh, cetane boosters and the polluent uh, formation. Since uh, 2017, he joined the cost in Professor Lacoste's group and uh, uh, the uh, plasmas and the flames group. His current research interests are ma mainly focused on the OH cleave diagnostics in hydrogen detonations and the development of a spectroscopic code in collaboration with uh, Tsinghua University. And now I will give the podium to uh, Carl. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thanks. So uh, th thank you uh, for your introduction. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present uh, our recent work on the or it brief uh, diagnostic in uh, hydrogen uh, detonation. So as you have said, um, so this work has been done in collaboration uh, between KAUST and Tsinghua University. So uh, the experimental work has been performed uh, in KAUST uh, in the group of Professor Diana Lacoste um, and the development of the spectroscopic code uh, called uh, CATLIF has been joined, uh, has been performed, uh, developed in collaboration between KAUST and Tsinghua University in, uh, prof with Professor Remy Neda. So uh, before starting the presentation, uh, I would like to make uh, some acknowledgements. So first uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, KAUST and the CCRC for their financial support. And uh, in addition to that, I also would like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors. So because most of the, re the results you will see today are uh, coming from these uh, two publications. So one which is currently under review in Commission and Flame, and another one that uh, has been mainly presented at the at the last IGDERS. So as I said, so this the second publication has been presented at the last IGDERS and um, is now available in this shockwave paper. So this is the outline of my presentation. So it's uh, pretty common. So I will first introduce a bit the context of the study. Then I will present to you the numerical tools and mainly uh, the cat leaf code. Then I will present you the experimental setup that we call the ODD setup. And then I will present you the, the main uh, results of the study. And I will finally conclude with some uh, take home uh, messages. Uh, so first the introduction. So uh, as many um, combustion studies nowadays, so our research is mainly driven uh, to face the current uh, challenges in combustion, which are to find a more uh, efficient com uh, combustion process and also to reduce our CO2 emissions. So, uh, and this can be achieved uh, through a detonation uh, regime of combustion. So this figure on the right hand side here represents the thermal efficiency as function of the compression ratio for different uh, thermodynamic cycle. So the first one is the ficket jacob cycle, which is an ideal detonation cycle. The second one is the Humphrey cycle, so which stands for a constant volume uh, combustion cycle. And the last one is the right hand cycle, a constant pressure cycle, which, is, uh, which corresponds to the thermodynamic cycle currently employed in a gas turbine. And as you can see from this figure, so you can have a thermal efficiency gain around 20% if you move from the Brighton cycle to the ficket jacob cycle. So uh, another interesting point uh, with detonation is uh, if you uh, perform hydrogen detonation, so you can generate uh, uh, thermal power without emitting any CO2 emission if you consider a tank wheel uh, analysis. 
And uh, nowadays, uh, both both of these aspects are actually of high interest as we are uh, moving to uh, transition to low carbon energy. And this can be even further extended if you consider uh, detonation with electrofuels, so meaning fuels generated from uh, renewable electricity. So as you know, uh, there is a two kind of uh, detonation engine concept. So the oldest one, if we can say it, it's uh, the pulse detonation engine. So one of the, the limitations of this engine is it, it does not provide a continuous thrust, and uh, this uh, this continuous uh, this non continuous thrust is actually limited by so the so operation frequency that uh, can be uh, reached with this engine. So meaning by how fast you can feel and fire a detonation in it. So that's why there is a, a growing interest in a rotating detonation engine called RDE. And in this engine, so you have a continuous uh, detonation wave uh, traveling into an, uh, an analog chamber. And with the real-time uh, video, so as you can see, you actually obtain a, a continuous thrust. So the second reason why uh, you could be interested uh, in detonation is for the safety of uh, buildings or uh, human safety. So in uh, those applications, so you are mainly interested in, in the DDT uh, mechanism, so the deflagration to detonation transition, or the detonation propagation in limits in simple or complex environment, or even the quenching mechanism of the detonation. So some recent example to illustrate why this is important. So one of the probably most known one is the nuclear power plant accident that occurred in Fukushima in 2011, in which uh, hydrogen was involved. And then there is a, a series of a more uh, recent explosion where the link through detonation was not confirmed yet, but with the most recent one that occurred uh, last year in uh, Lebanon. And just as a personal thought that I would like to share, so maybe we should also uh, consider the safety of emerging technologies, because uh, if you think about what is a fuel cell vehicle, so it's a, a car that uh, you, you drive with a 700 bar of hydrogen and that you combine with an electrical powertrain, a high energy electrical powertrain. So I will let you uh, imagine what could obtain in a case of an accident where you have hydrogen leak with this uh, high electrical powertrain. So now uh, what I will try is to make a brief uh, uh, literature review on how uh, hydrogen determination uh, uh, has been characterized so far. So in literature, uh, many different important parameters were defined, uh, such as uh, critical parameters uh, to initiate the detonation, so critical pressure, critical to diameter, or critical energy to initiate the detonation. Uh, another uh, important parameter that was identified is uh, detonation speed in uh, different experimental conditions or in different geometries. So these measurements are typically performed by recording the time of arrival of your detonation between a series of ionic probes or pressure sensor. And as you know, the distance uh, between the two sensors, you can calculate an average speed uh, velocity. Uh, another important parameter is the uh, measurements of the cell size uh, based on the well-known uh, suit foil technique. So this is our, these are just four examples of uh, suit foil uh, measurements for hydrogen, oxygen, uh, and argon mixture and hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen mixtures. And as you can see, when you reduce um, the, the dilution or when you move from argon diluted to nitrogen diluted mixture, you have a less regular cell size uh, as uh, your mixture is becoming more unstable. So uh, some other uh, techniques were also employed, such as the optical diagnostic to characterize detonation. So I split uh, the optical diagnostic in uh, two categories. So one for which you can have, uh, that has been re relatively widely employed and where you can find a significant amount of data. So such as the Schlieren or the shadow graphy or the OH chemiluminescence technique. But one of the drawback of both of these techniques is they are line of sight integrated. So meaning that if you have more than one cell size in the depth of the field of view, the interpretation of the result uh, might become challenging. Well, then that's why you have uh, another uh, uh, optical diagnostic, other type of uh, optical diagnostic that has been employed, which are, are using um, uh, laser, uh, laser, laser based optical diagnostic. So first uh, we found 
I found, we found one paper dealing with relay scattering and uh, several papers dealing with OHPF uh, only. So meaning that uh, even if these techniques are good for structure characterization, there is significantly less uh, data available in literature. And now, uh, as you could guess from the title of my talk, I will just present you a bit more uh, what has been done so far in, with the OHPF technique. So uh, keep in mind that the, the papers I will, that I will be presented are uh, uh, OHPF technique that has been employed in hydrogen detonation in a simple, relatively simple uh, configuration. So uh, from this literature review, we found that the first images were actually obtained at Caltech by Pinjan and Austin. So these are some examples of the images uh, they actually obtained. So uh, for both uh, argon diluted mixture and nitrogen diluted mixture. So uh, all their images that they published uh, were actually obtained in the linear regime of fluorescence with relatively low energy per pulse. And in their studies, they only investigated a single a laser excitation wavelength, uh, which actually corresponds to uh, these two OH uh, transition. Uh, in addition, all the measurements were mainly done at low pressure, um, which is uh, which is uh, below 20 kilopascal. And uh, an, an important thing uh, to note about these OH PLIF images is they are still the main source of OH PLIF uh, in the literature for hydrogen detonation, but not only, as they also studied other mixtures. So then a bit more recently, so Wang et al. Uh, investigated a similar uh, argon diluted hydrogen oxygen mixture, uh, but this time at slightly higher pressure. Uh, uh, their, study was, uh, their study was performed with the, with the same laser excitation wavelength, but this time they were using a, a different laser orientation, so a transverse laser orientation, where you have the laser uh, that is traveling perpendicular to the detonation uh, wave. A, an important thing that you might notice if you know a bit uh, OH brief images is uh, they had to saturate uh, their camera in order to visualize the detonation from the overall height of their visualization field. So, and so because of this uh, saturation of the camera, you have actually uh, quite limited quantitative information that you can uh, extract from these two images. So then uh, a bit more uh, recently, so there is a, a series of papers from uh, Mevel and Porter, which actually evidence uh, the main limitation of the OHP technique in detonation conditions. So some of their uh, key findings were the following. So first of all, you cannot make a, a direct comparison between the experimental uh, leaf intensity and the OH mole fraction from your simulation. So as you can see here, um, with the 1D simulation, you have a comparison of experimental leaf signal and the OH mole fraction from ZND simulation. As you can see, there is quite large discrepancy. And they also demonstrated this from a 2D uh, numerical simulation, as represented here. But this, the second thing they also demonstrated is if you post-process your simulation result uh, with a LIF model, you can actually uh, make experimental simulation comparison and reproduce the experimental trend. So they demonstrated this with uh, this uh, 1D simulation case, but also with this uh, 2D simulation cases. And uh, they explained this discrepancy uh, because uh, you have, in detonation condition, you have a strong laser absorption, which leads uh, to non-physical imaging of the detonation. So uh, then after that, we started our collaboration uh, with uh, Tsinghua University, and we uh, further developed the, the LEAF model that I previously uh, talked about. Uh, and in a, a more recent publication, we investigated the effect of the laser orientation on the OH PLIF imaging. So similar to their study, we started from an OH field from numerical simulation, and then we numerically imposed a, a, a laser using both the frontal and the transverse orientation. And as you can see, you get two significantly different images using one or the other laser orientation. Uh, one advantage of using the transverse orientation is you get a leaf signal that is actually more representative to the OH field, or at least for short optical path, 
as you can see here. And you can also observe all uh, structure that are representative of the OH field quite far from the front, which was not possible before. But however, you still have the same, main, the same drawback that for both uh, high leaf intensity, uh, so for both orientation, you have a high leaf intensity that is restricted to short optical path, meaning that here you have a strong absorption for long one. And this uh, actually demonstrates that you still have non-physical imaging, no matter which or laser orientation you use, so which is uh, still a problem. And uh, so now, uh, uh, before concluding about this literature review, I want to make uh, a small uh, comment that you also have other uh, publication in literature available where you can find OH -PLIF images. But uh, these papers that are, I'm not talking about are using a, a, more, a more complicated experimental geometry or are using either a different fuel or more com uh, a different leaf technique. So this is just a non-exhaustive list of some of these paper. And these two paper are just also some other usage of the leaf models that we just discussed. But anyway, uh, the, the conclusion from this is if, even if you, compare the num if you compare the number of publication in both the deflagration community and the detonation community, there are significantly uh, less paper uh, talking about OH -PLIF in detonation, meaning that there is uh, significantly more, more work that is required to uh, in this field. So now, uh, as a summary of, of my literature review, so we can, we can say that we have a limited amount of OHPF data uh, available in literature, and uh, that uh, so this lack of data is, uh, is quite challenging for numerical simulation validation. Uh, most of the OHPF images were actually obtained at relatively low pressure with a single excitation scheme. And, all the, and the last point is that all the images that are available uh, have a strong laser absorption, which leads to a non-physical uh, visualization of the detonation front. So the question that we ask ourselves is, uh, can we obtain a more physically consistent OH cliff images uh, in detonation conditions? So to answer this question, so we, we actually developed and validated the spectroscopic uh, leaf codes that we called uh, cat leaf to numerically identify the key parameter playing a role on the OH cliff imaging. And the second objective of the study is to propose alternative excitation strategies uh, that uh, could help to obtain a more physically consistent OH cliff images. So now uh, I will uh, present you the cat leaf code. Um, but before doing so, I will just uh, briefly recall uh, what is the principle of laser induced uh, fluorescence. So as any other uh, laser diagnostic, so uh, uh, leaf is about uh, light and matter interaction. So here are just uh, represented the uh, OH, uh, OH molecules that are in your reacting media. And this molecule will actually interact with the laser by absorbing energy, which will uh, make move the molecule from the, their ground state to an excited state. And uh, once your laser is turned off, so they cannot remain in this excited state and they need to uh, release the energy by emitting light. And that's what we call the fluorescence. So now if we look at, the, at this leaf process uh, using the OH energy potential diagram, so here is represented the energy as function of the OH uh, distance. So you can represent the two electro electronic state of the OH molecule. So the ground state Higgs and the ground state is uh, the first excited state A. So on both of these excited states, you can represent different vibrational levels. And on each of these vibrational levels, you have different rotational uh, levels. So in an, in an ideal world uh, where you could have a, an extremely narrow laser, you could uh, potentially target a single OH transition, a representative to a single pair of rotational level in the ground state and the excited state. But in reality, you actually have uh, all the laser are spectrally wide, which means that you, you excite multiple uh, OH transition. And as we have seen before, so when you excite your molecule from the ground state to the excited state, then they have to de-excite and they can do that through different process. So either through dissociation, quenching or the fluorescent process that we are interested in. 
So this uh, simple um, so this simple schematic just aims to uh, represent that even with a single uh, excitation uh, wavelength, you actually excite multiple OH uh, transition, which uh, makes uh, the in, which makes your which complexify your fluorescent spectrum with many emission lines uh, contributing into it. So, so now uh, I will try to uh, present you uh, cat leaf. But as we have seen in the in the literature, uh, there are actually several versions of a leaf model on which a cat leaf is based on. So as we have seen, the first version was developed by Mevel and co-author. And then we uh, started to collaborate uh, with Tsinghua University and developed it, uh, an earlier version of it. So here uh, in this uh, bullet list are listed the different uh, key features that were integrated in this version of the of the lift model. Uh, but as we have seen in the introduction, I already presented the why these two effects were important. So I will not present them again here. But I will try to briefly explain you uh, why these uh, three first points are important. So first, uh, I will try to explain you the broadening on, of the OH lines. So using a simple hydrogen, oxygen, um, uh, argon detonation at uh, 50 near 50 kPa initial conditions. So on the left hand side of this figure, uh, I am representing the normalized temperature and pressure profile evolution during the detonation process. And um, so as a function of the distance behind the shock. And here you have represented this red vertical line, which uh, actually represent the position at which uh, this figure is extracted. And on this figure, you have uh, uh, represented the void profile, which is uh, simply the convolution of each OH, uh, OH transition that are present in this spectral range. And uh, in the convolution of all this line gives you the void profile. Uh, here in green, you just have a, a typical laser profile that could, that could uh, potentially interact uh, with these transitions. Now, if we start the animation, so we can see how this uh, OH, the shape of these lines uh, evolve as a function of the different thermodynamic conditions uh, behind the shock. And as you can see, what you are observing is a, a narrowing of the line, because um, what we see during a detonation is a decrease of pressure as a function of the distance, meaning that you, as the pressure is decreasing, the lines are getting narrower. So this small animation just uh, is just here to present that the broadening of the line is not constant, this function of the thermodynamic condition. And that's why we need to model it properly, either inside a single detonation or for, multiple, uh, for different detonation conditions. So now uh, the second key feature is to consider the effect of the adjacent lines. So I'm using again the same example uh, as I presented you before, but this time I'm comparing uh, the evolution of the void profile uh, if I consider all the five lines nearby, or if I consider the two line, the two closest line uh, near the laser. And as you can see, uh, for high pressure, we can make a relatively large error around 15% uh, here. So the pressure is the highest at the beginnings and the error is then maximum here. So this means that for, uh, for uh, when you, you need to consider the adjacent line uh, when you are, when you are moving from low pressure cases to high pressure cases, and their contribution will become more and more important uh, further you go in, in pressure. So now the, the last effect I will try to explain you is the effect of the shift of the line. So, um, so this time I'm just presenting you a single uh, distance, so uh, uh, behind the shock with this uh, corresponding thermodynamic condition. So if you consider uh, your uh, laser um, at uh, uh, exactly between this transition based on, um, if you set your laser between these two transition, considering the line center of your line based on the, their position in the database, so meaning in vacuum, and you neglect any uh, line center shifts. So you have your laser, which is actually interacting with the, the maximum of the void profile. But in reality, it, it's, it's not, uh, What's happened? I mean, it's not the real position of the line because you have to consider 
the line center shifts. So because in detonation, you have a high speed flow and a high pressure flow. And this actually induce a shift of your uh, line uh, to the red. And as you can see now, you have uh, uh, the maximum of the profile, which is slightly shifted to the red. And as you could guess, so this shift is function of the pressure and the velocity of your flow. So meaning it has to be calculated for every uh, thermodynamic condition behind the shock, and it is changing for different detonation conditions. So now, uh, as I said, so we all these different features were included in the latest version of the LEAF model presented here, but we kept developing this model and recently referenced it as CatLEAF in a publication uh, from Rojas Chavez. Um, and in this a newer version of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the LEAF model, so we actually included a spectrally resolved uh, emission spectrum. So now I will try to uh, simply try to simply explain you uh, without going too much into the detail uh, how we calculate the leaf signal. So as you have as we have seen before, um, so the leaf is the leaf is a two step process. So first you have the absorption and then the emission. So that's actually how we calculate uh, our leaf signal. So first we calculate an absorption term for every OH transition interacting uh, uh, with the laser. So we calculate we call this term CI. So for which uh, we take uh, we calculate the Boltzmann fraction from Hytran uh, database. Then uh, we have uh, three laser terms which are called the dimensionless overlap integral, the normalized uh, spectral laser irradiance, and the absorption based energy factor. So these three terms are simply here to uh, quantify how much your laser is actually uh, interacting with your transition. And I will ex explain you this in this figure. So here you have your uh, initial laser profile that is represented in a given uh, spectral range. And as your laser is, is propagating through an absorbing media, so you may need to consider an absorption of your laser. And then as only part of your laser will be actually, uh, will, uh, actually um, interact with the OH transition, you need the last term, which is the gamma term. And then the remaining uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the formula is a bit more simpler. You take the OH number density as an input, you take the Einstein B coefficient and the quenching rate uh, from, which is based on the mixture composition. So as I said just before, so the leaf is a two-step process. So now we have the absorption term, and then we need to calculate the contribution of each emission lines uh, uh, with which we will de-excite from this uh, excited state to go back to the ground state. So this is represent this uh, contribution of each of the line is represented with this summation term. So here we have the psi that we just calculated before, and then we we had the contribution we had the, the term Einstein a coefficient, which is just a coefficient representative of the emission line, and then we add the shape of the emission line, which is based on the thermodynamic conditions we are. And uh, if we then consider, so the previous calculation I show you are for only a single excitation line, but if we add the contribution of all the other lines uh, interacting with the laser, we can get our total fluorescence signal for given thermodynamic conditions. And then if we combine uh, the different thermodynamic conditions uh, behind the shock, we can reconstruct um, uh, the following 2D figure where we have the fluorescence intensity as function of the distance behind the shock. And each of these stripes actually represent the emission lines uh, inside our fluorescence spectrum. So now um, another uh, important feature of CatLeaf I would like to uh, talk about is that CatLeaf is a um, simulation I'll perform with respect to the beam path, so meaning that CatLeaf is 1D uh, resolved. So as an input, you, I mean, you have the first position of your simulation, and you also have a last special position for your simulation. So in the case of a typical uh, uh, ZND simulation with a frontal laser orientation, this is how we could represent it. So the first uh, position of our simulation are at the shock, and the last one are represented uh, here in the CJ condition. 
So then for x0, what you need as an input is just your initial uh, laser uh, input profile. If you neglect uh, any interaction at t0, p0. And then what you need is the thermodynamic condition at this specific condition x0. And then the high trend uh, database to get the spectroscopic parameter. So as we have seen with this three information, we calculate the laser absorption term we saw on the previous slide, then the total fluorescence intensity. And then depending on the OH filter we have to consider, we obtain a, a leaf spectrum at the given position x0. And then now, once we have this information, before moving to the next special position, we need to calculate uh, 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 the absorption uh, energy correction factor, which is which we have seen is called IB. And with this term, we use it for the next special position to correct our initial input profile. And, and we use this uh, corrected laser profile as an input of our new laser absorption calculation with the new thermodynamic condition at x, x1. And this gives us the new OH leaf uh, spectrum for this new specific position. And then again, before moving to the next position, we calculate the new IB term. And if we keep doing this process until x n, we can actually reconstruct the 2D image I just presented you on the previous slide. But now uh, I will uh, briefly explain you how we obtain uh, this uh, temperature and pressure evolution uh, behind the shark. So to do our ZND simulation, uh, we, we perform all this simulation using ZNDKIN, which is an in-house code uh, based on KIMKIN2. So for the kinetics, uh, we employed the reaction model of uh, Mevel et al. Um, and this uh, last figure is just a typical, it's just an example of the typical profile we obtain with this code uh, for hyd uh, stoichiometric hydrogen air uh, detonation at uh, room temperature and 50 kPa condition. So if you remember, uh, the objective of the study was to perform a, a parametric study. So here I just listed the different uh, parameters uh, we, we are planning to investigate with the uh, cat leaf and see their effect on the uh, OH plif images. So some of these, uh, so the parametric study is based on uh, investigating the effect of the pressure, the effect of the diluent, and the effect of the excitation line. And we compare all these results uh, based on two quantities of interest. So the first one is the, it's called the leaf max, which is the peak of the fluorescence signal. So as it represented here on this um, normalized uh, fluorescence uh, signal. And the second one is actually a, a narrow analysis that we performed on the recalculated uh, NO, uh, OH number density on the recalculated OH number density. And we compare this, uh, we obtain this from the lift signal and a calibration constant determined at the, the maximum of the fluorescent signal. So this error analysis is actually uh, performed by comparing this recalculated OH number density with the OH number density from ZND simulation. And, um, and this error is performed on the overall um, simulation domain up to 10 centimeter. And just as an example here, when you compare these two curves at this specific position, you have an error of two, meaning that you have a factor of two error on the predicted OH number density. Now I will present you the experimental setup. So the optical uh, detonation duct that we employed uh, uh, is, has a, a rectangular uh, section of 20 millimeter by 170 millimeter square. Uh, it is equipped with optical access. So as you can see here, it has a different section that we also called uh, modules. So the two first one aims to uh, generate, to initiate our detonation. And the two, uh, the, the two in the middle actually aims to stabilize the generated detonation. And the two last one are just for diagnostic purposes. So to briefly uh, tell you the experimental procedure, so all the mixture uh, are directly prepared uh, in the detonation duct. And once the mixture is ready, so we ignite uh, the mixture with this three spark plug, which uh, generate a, a weak flame that is actually expanding and traveling through the tube. And then this flame is actually 
interacting and accelerating with the obstacle that are represented here. And at the end of this, uh, the obstacle, we generate uh, a detonation that is traveling through the end of the, of the detonation duct. So for this a specific pressure sensor, uh, we use it to trigger our PLIF system and synchronize uh, our laser pulse with the time of arrival of, uh, of the detonation between our windows. So just to give you some numbers, uh, so we also made some uh, velo velocity measurements within our window. And among all the measurements we did, we have very repeatable measurements with less than 1% uh, variation in our, uh, in our detonation velocity. And as you can see, this detonation velocity is close to the CJSP. So now uh, to validate uh, the cat leaf code, so we conducted a series of experiments in which uh, we investigated the effect of the pressure on the lift, on the lift uh, image, the effect of the excitation line. So as you can see here, uh, we did not investigate uh, this line, um, and I will explain you in a few slides why. So this uh, image uh, actually uh, is a typical image uh, we obtain uh, with our experimental setup. So for hydrogen air uh, detonation at 50 kPa and using Q16 oxidation scheme. Uh, oh, my computer froze. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think it's back. Okay, so, yeah. and this second image is actually obtained with Q28, Q19. So just, and on all these images, we did a, a light uh, pass processing. So meaning that we corrected the background noise of the camera. We also corrected the laser sheet energy profile. And in order to compare our experimental results with the simulation, we did an averaging uh, within this region of interest to compare the fluorescence intensity. So then now I will present you the main results of the study. So, uh, but before doing so, we need to, uh, I need to present you uh, an important effect of the OH filter on the fluorescent signal. So as you have seen in the cat leaf workflow, so we can add the contribution of the OH filter from our uh, raw uh, uh, simulated uh, fluorescence uh, spectrum. So here is a, a, an ex a similar to what we have seen before. So it's the fluorescence spectrum for typical hydrogen air detonation at 50 kPa. So this time using the Q16 excitation scheme. So here is represented the laser excitation wavelength. Here, the dotted line represents the induction length for this specific mixture. And when we change the, when we change the excitation wavelength, you can see that different emission lines are contributing to our signal. So now uh, for each of, um, as we have to consider the OH filter to compare our uh, measurements with experimental data, so we decided to investigate the effect of two different filters. So the first one is actually uh, an ideal uh, filter, which has a 100% transmission, uh, uh, two nanometer outside of the excitation wavelength. And this, uh, so we, using this filter, we actually obtain the following uh, fluorescence intensity as function of the distance behind the shock. So as you can see here, we obtain um, we obtain the strongest uh, leaf max for Q17 excitation scheme. Now, if we uh, compare these results uh, with the, co uh, the with the other results that we obtain with commercially available filters, so we post uh, we consider numerically uh, these filters. So for each uh, excitation scheme, these are the filter we consider. And by doing so, as you can imagine, we we are significantly less efficient uh, in collecting uh, the, light, the, the light. So uh, this has a direct impact on the different profiles. So for instance, now uh, the highest leaf max is obtained for Q28, Q19. Uh, and compared to the previous cases with our ideal filter, we already have lost 40% of our signal. And this time uh, Q17 is actually the lowest uh, excitation scheme, and that's why we did not investigate it uh, experimentally. So just a remark for the following slides. So uh, for the 
all the simulation results that you will see in the coming slide. So we consider only the commercially available filters in, in our simulation method. And this is actually making sense because it also corresponds to the filters that we employed uh, experimentally. So the first validation we did uh, is using the experimental laser scan we did to uh, identify, uh, uh, to characterize our laser excitation wavelength. So we did this uh, using a, a slot burner, using a, a, a methane air flame, so at uh, atmospheric condition. So in addition to the comparison with the experimental data, so we also compared the simulation results with the leaf-based simulation. So this is the first uh, result uh, we obtain. Uh, this is the first validation figure near Q16. So as you can see, um, you have a, a good agreement uh, between cat leaf, uh, leaf base, and the experimental data. So uh, now on another uh, range of wavelength. Yeah. So, so as you can see here in this spectral range, we also have a good agreement. And if you uh, look a bit closer, we actually have still a better agreement uh, between cat leaf and the experimental uh, data. Uh, compared to the um, to leaf based simulation so with these two figures we can actually say that cat leaf is validated for a large number of excitation lines uh, for atmospheric uh, flame conditions but what we are interested in is actually uh, to validate our code on detonation conditions that's what we did after that um, so uh, what we did is we uh, investigated uh, 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 stoichiometric hydrogen air detonation uh, at two pressure uh, condition. So in the first case, what we did is we changed the excitation wavelength uh, for uh, on the on the 50 kPa condition to see how the fluorescence intensity is uh, is evolving as function of the laser energy per pulse. So here, what you have is the symbols represent the experimental data, and the solid line represents the cat leaf uh, simulations. So from this first figure, we can say that uh, we are in the linear regime of fluorescence, which is something we wanted because cat leaf is only valid for a linear regime of fluorescence right now. Uh, the second thing is if we look at the change uh, of, the, of the slope uh, between um, uh, by, by changing one excitation scheme to another, we actually have experimentally a decrease of the fluorescence intensity by 17%. While when we change, uh, when we when we predicted uh, from the from cat leaf, a decrease of sixteen percent. So this is a, a good achievement because we are uh, nearly. Uh, I mean, we are we are predicting quantitatively how much the fluorescence signal is evolving for two different excitation scheme. And now we we tried uh, we did a validation of the pressure effect, but this time using a single excitation scheme. So as you can see, we compared the 100 kPa case with the 50 kPa case. And uh, when you move from the 100 kPa to the 50 kPa, experimentally, we observed a gain of 70% of fluorescence intensity, while in the simulation, uh, we obtained a gain of, uh, we predicted a gain of 61%. So from this two figure, uh, we, can, we can say that uh, uh, both the effect of the excitation line and the effect of the pressure seems to be uh, uh, validated uh, for detonation conditions as well. So now, uh, if you uh, remember from one of the objectives of the study was to make a parametric study. So uh, we wanted to investigate the effect of the mixture, the effect of the pressure and the effect of the excitation line on two different uh, parameters. So the first one was leaf max, and the second one was the error uh, between the OH number density from the simulation and the recalculated one from the fluorescent signal. So if we look at the leaf max results, so all the results that you see are actually uh, normalized by these conditions to make the interpretation of the results simpler. And if you look at the results, so we see that for every uh, for every condition, we actually have uh, the strongest leaf max uh, with the Q28, Q19 excitation scheme. And now if we look at the other parameters, we can actually see that uh, you, you maximize your fluorescence intensity if you are argon diluted and at relatively uh, low pressure. So now, if we look at the error analysis, so again, the lowest error is obtained for Q28 plus Q19, 
um, and this this time uh, if you if you look at the pressure effect so you if you want to minimize the error it's better to be this time in a nitrogen diluted condition and if you compare the pressure it's better also to be uh, at relatively low pressure if you want to minimize the error but an important thing to note is actually that the lowest error that we obtain among all of these conditions is actually around 40 percent meaning that uh, currently it's not feasible to make any quantitative uh, OE, uh, number density measurements from a, a single point a single point calibration with any of these three uh, excitation schemes so now i will uh, I will try to present you the, briefly the second objective of the study, which was to identify alternative excitation strategies in order to obtain more physically consistent OH PLIF images. So to, to do that, so we identified two alternative uh, strategies. So the first one is to make uh, OH, uh, OH, uh, OH PLIF measurements in saturated regime of fluorescence. And the second one is to make the measurements in optically thin regime as it has been defined in this publication. So just to briefly explain what does it mean optically thin regime, it means that you have a negligible a spatial uh, laser energy fluctuation along your beam path and meaning you obtain such a condition where you have limited uh, laser absorption and this and to, to reach such condition we actually identified uh, an, an excitation wavelength here um, uh, near Q28 plus Q19, and we did identified it uh, by plotting the absorption cross section uh, for the von Neumann condition here. And as you can see, by off centering your laser from Q28 and Q19 uh, lines, you actually can decrease your absorption cross section, meaning the absorption of your laser, by one order of magnitude. And fortunately, we also identified uh, another excitation wavelength uh, 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 near Q28 plus Q, Q19, which was R117. And this line has been identified as a good candidate for saturated regime of fluorescence. So keep in mind that these two excitation strategies are just a proof of concept. There's probably many other lines that could be identified with many, maybe better results. But the idea here is just to prove uh, the capability of, the, of these two excitation strategies. So now, uh, first, I will compare the, the OH PLIF images we obtained for stoichiometric hydrogen hair detonation at 50 kPa using uh, either the, the conventional excitation scheme or the two new ones. So if you remember, I presented you earlier these two images. So if you look at them a bit more closely, so you can observe that you have a, a leaf signal that drops relatively fast, like after 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter after your shock, you don't, you nearly have a no leaf signal. Uh, while uh, when you use our a new, the new proposed excitation strategies, you can actually have a leaf signal until the beginning of the window, meaning several centimeters away from the shock. So now if we push a bit further the analysis of these images by comparing the 1D average leaf signal and the OH number density. So when we look at the conventional excitation scheme, we see that the normalized uh, leaf profile are actually pretty similar. And they are both uh, in disagreement with the OH number density. But when we had on this figure our two excitation scheme, uh, uh, we have actually a, a strong signal gain as we observed on the on the previous uh, images and this gain of signal actually enabled us to visualize uh, laser uh, fluorescence uh, leaf signal fluctuations uh, on both uh, the new excitation scheme and this uh, fluorescence intensity fluctuation was already present before but could not be observed because this, the level of signal was too low so now if we look a bit more specifically uh, on the results of excitation one. So we can see that we did not fully reach the saturated region of fluorescence for long distances. But as we, ha as we have a good agreement between excitation one and excitation two, we can actually uh, believe that we are in the saturated region of fluorescence or at least near the saturated region of fluorescence. 
And now if we look at the uh, leaf signal for excitation two, we can actually observe that we have a, a leaf signal plateau as observed from the OH number density from the simulation. And this is a, quite a good achievement because it tells us that both uh, strategies are uh, promising uh, for uh, are promising to obtain more physically consistent visualization of detonation waves. And now uh, I will conclude uh, with some uh, take home uh, messages. So as you have seen, uh, we have a validated uh, spectrally resolved uh, leaf model that we called cat leaf. So we, uh, by doing a parametric study, we identified some important parameters of the OHP diagnostic, such as the collection optics, as you have seen, you can have very, uh, very different uh, fluorescence in intensity, depending on if you consider a commercially available filter, or if you have a custom made filter where you have, when, when you are, where you are more efficient to collect uh, the fluorescence signal. And if you want to maximize, so uh, in addition to that, we also made a, based on the quantities of interest that we investigated, if you want to maximize a lift signal, it's better to be in such condition. But if you want to minimize a zero in the objective of being quantitative, it's better to be this time uh, air diluted for Q, with Q28, Q19 and at relatively low pressure. Uh, in addition to that, uh, another uh, achievement was uh, with the error analysis we did. So it is currently uh, not possible to, to make a quantitative uh, measurements with any of the con conventional excitation scheme for any practical detonation, meaning above 50 kPa. But there is hope because uh, we, we can actually have more physically consistent uh, OH brief images uh, if we use uh, any of the two uh, excitation strategies uh, that we propose. And uh, with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, one more time the team uh, who made this work possible, and I would be happy to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Uh, this uh, is very interesting and uh, very informative uh, presentation. This is a lot of for, yeah. for me, uh, I guess, for, for my colleagues to learn from you. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask uh, the audience uh, to uh, for, for questions, uh, for comments. Uh, if you have, please uh, unmute yourself and directly ask Carl. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, maybe I, because uh, I'm not really a, an expert in all this uh, experimental with this uh, PLEAF uh, diagnostics. Uh, so yes. I, I don't think I have like a very uh, smart uh, question, uh, but I, I just don't, uh, uh, could you uh, just explain a, a bit more about why this uh, other excitation uh, schemes can help uh, with uh, achieving a quantitative measurement? Like what was so the, advantage I, I don't think I, I fully understood so yeah for, for sure this is a new excitation scheme will be better at least for uh, quantitative uh, for qualitative uh, measurements because as you can see you can okay. see further the structure uh, behind the shock then uh, then the quantitative cap capabilities are still quite unsure so it needs to be demonstrated and there are many challenges to make a quantitative measurements uh, with the OH proof uh, diagnostic, so mm -hmm. we, we cannot uh, say strongly it's it's feasible to make quantitative measurements with both, but for sure uh, the the good the, I mean the advantage is you have um, you could make a better qualitative uh, comparison of your OH field uh, if you keep improving the 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 laser excitation wavelengths because right now it's just a proof of concept that by better uh, choosing your laser excitation wavelength you can actually reduce the laser absorption and have a better visualization of uh, the detonation. So it needs further improvement, but that's that's the way to go, basically. That's the, the key message. Okay, I see. So most of this, because um, uh, I, I, I saw in some papers, uh, they have this uh, uh, plea uh, visualization for RDEs. So for those experiments, this. It, it's just like kind of like a, um, a visualization or like an observation tool rather than get, getting close to a, uh, to a, any quantitative uh, measurement. Is that so what you're I suggesting? Think uh, you're referring to the 
work of uh, Chacon, which is which yeah, was presented at yeah. the AAA, right? Mm, in an RDC, yeah. right? With the optical access. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I've seen these images. So the, the thing is in RDE, you know, you never reach the CJ, uh, the real CJ conditions, you are significantly below. So meaning mm. that um, your pressure is like, um, like six times lower compared to a, an atmospheric detonation. So as your pressure is lower, you actually have less absorption. So mm. by being, uh, by having a non-ideal detonation, it's actually more favorable for the diagnostic because they mm. they are not reaching the 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 CJ condition. I mean that's the way I, okay. I, I see it because when you look at the pressure traces, it's around uh, three three to four bars if I'm okay. not wrong. So which is significantly uh, below the the CJ condition for hydrogen air. Okay, I see. So and uh, yeah, we don't see we don't see a blurring of the detonation because it's so short that we almost literally freeze the detonation in in the condition where we observe it. Okay, how long does the um so so like regarding the timing um when you uh when you shoot it with the laser, how long mm -hmm. do, does it take for uh for the I, you might have kind of gone over this, but like, how long does the process of absorption, excitation, and then and then de uh, take? The time scale are very very short. It's okay. about it's nano nanosecond. Oh, nanosecond. Scale. Okay, okay. It's not like a, it's not like a chemical reaction or something. No, no, no not at all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. Yeah, I have a further comments. I I think I have you know it's again like my quite like intuitive. Uh, thought like it might not be um, that easily feasible because I think like uh, you know in some experiments they um, uh, people managed to stabilize a detonation wave uh, as an oblique detonation right like if yes. you have some kind of flow reactive flow premixed and then uh, do you think like this uh, stabilized detonation is something uh, easier or favorable for uh, for this uh, uh, plea for diagnostics. Are you guys considering uh, uh, building such a facility, or is it just something uh, really crazy and not not really feasible? I, at I mean, uh, I, so you, you mean the detonation is stationary? Yeah, like the, somehow, like the, you, you have the flow is moving, but uh, so the flow compensates the speed of the detonation. Yeah, yeah, like the detonation is stays there, so you can actually have a longer time to. To, to observe, uh, yeah. Yeah, observe. I mean, I right. didn't see uh, such uh, experiment yet mm. in the literature, but uh, I mean, I, even if your the location of your front is stationary, I assume that uh, it has some dynamics, right? So right. you have a, you have a transverse wave that must uh, that must be not stationary. So you you, you the location of your front is at the same. Is the same, but the structure of your detonation is changing over time. Still, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just I mean, like the, the way I understand what mm. what you are telling me. I mean, uh, I, I am I don't see which paper you are talking about. So, but uh, oh no, I, I don't think there is any work uh, done on on that. But I think I have seen some paper or experimental work that people managed to stabilize the oblique detonation. Okay. I just don't know if this kind of a a uh, stationary uh, detonation is something you know is can somehow improve on the point of uh, having longer observation time because i, mean, I, I think, think... Uh, it's kind of like it might be a crazy idea because you you need to have this uh, pre-mixed uh, explosive flow uh, mm -hmm. uh, being uh, fitted be, being fed into the chamber mm -hmm. that might sound dangerous but i i just uh, i don't know like if it's anyway close <laughs> to, yeah, uh, and... to and even if you're, for me, even if your detonation is stationary, I think you would mm. still have some dynamic in the structure. Right. So meaning right. that you will not gain uh, in uh, exposure time or whatever, because okay. you you will still have the, the the dynamic of the detonation that will be yeah. um, very quick, even though it's stationary in the laboratory laboratory frame of reference. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
but I, I really have never seen such an experimental setup, so I would be mm. quite curious to see if it's feasible. I don't, mm. I'm not okay. sure. Okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, I was I will look up this uh, this um, experiments. I, I, will, I, I think I can send you if I can find it. I, I will double check like if my understanding about their experimental setup is correct. For the, uh, yeah, I will let you know if I can find that. So. Yeah, sure. The, yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your answer. Hi, Carl. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah, it's it's a bit low, but yeah, I can hear you. This is this is Josue. Nice work. <laughs> thanks. No, I I was curious about the the latest pictures that you showed. Was that a frontal orientation laser that you managed to get all this all this yes. signal way back there? Yes, it was both uh, frontal orientation. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's that's nice. So, have you tried post-processing the the images that 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 we had at some point with the new excitation scheme to see what that gives? So, can, can you say it again because I, I can't hear you very well. Have you tried post-processing the images that yep. that you were showing before with the new excitation scheme? So, meaning this profile, this one D profile, you mean? No, the 2D uh, numerical stuff to... Yes, so yeah, so that could be... It, to post that could be the next plan to use... Uh, lines. Yeah. The, to to the, use your, the simulation energy. from the shockwave paper and compare in the same condition. So th and these are slightly different thing. conditions. Anything so they cannot be compared directly. Because uh, you remember the 2D simulations are in a, are argon diluted. Yeah. Uh, and these conditions are in air. Okay, so, so my bad. I, so they, I and as, we, as, yeah. as I have shown, there is some effect of the diluent on the on the lift max or even on the, for instance, intensity evolution. So uh, yeah, we either need to redo the simulation or we we need to make a hydrogen, oxygen, argon mixture to compare with the previous simulation. But we cannot cross it. We can do both. Oh, we can do both. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. All right. It's a matter Thanks. of time after that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Higgins, uh, he just uh, posted some links to a paper, uh, I think two papers uh, in the mid 90s by Hansen's group at Stanford uh, doing some plea uh, diagnosis for a stabilized oblique uh, detonation. I don't know if he want to comment yeah, on this. Or, I mean, uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah. There was there were some experiments done in the in the mid '90s. Uh, Ron Henson's group had a an expansion tube where they could accelerate uh, combustible mixtures over wedges, and I don't really know if they would be called oblique detonation waves. It was more yeah. oblique shock and yeah. because the conditions, the pressures and, 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 and uh, densities were very, very low. So you didn't really mm -hmm. see cellular structure and so on, but they could, they could see a uh, shock induced combustion behind an oblique shock stabilized on a wedge. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was, you know, almost 30 years ago. So I would imagine it would be worthwhile coming back and revisiting that with all of the advances mm -hmm. that have been made in the mm -hmm. lasers and cameras and so on. And, you know, there are groups that are looking at oblique detonation waves in, in hypersonic test facilities that would mm -hmm. be closer to the real similitude that you would see in a, in a, in a, in a shock induced combustion scramjet engine, you know, with higher mm -hmm. densities and pressures. So yeah, could be, could be done. Would be interested to come back and revisit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think what you're saying also is maybe, I mean, as I made this comment at the end of my review, there are, actually some other papers related to the supersonic combustion community where you have weight proof uh, imaging. So, so maybe this, these papers are related to that and that's why uh, I did not uh, go into the detail of these two papers. But uh, maybe I have them in my, in, in my list of paper. But um, yeah, because I have some oblique detonation wave paper, some supersonic combustion where you have weight proof images. But it's not detonation when you are in supersonic combustion because you don't have the coupling between the shock wave and the reaction front. So it's a bit different. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any further comments and questions?
Yeah, if it's not, then uh, I would like to thank our speaker, uh, Carl Chapman, uh, again. Yeah, thank you for your time preparing this very interesting talk and, uh, and giving us this uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, and uh, thank you all for attending the uh, today's meeting. And uh, next week, uh, we will have uh, uh, Dr. James Brown uh, from Purdue University presenting us some work related to a rotating detonation engine. And the talk will be again on Thursday, next Thursday, like in a week from now. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you all again and uh, have a good day and good night. Yeah, bye-bye. Hope to see you all in the future events. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you very much. Bye, Carl. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.